How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on the show, the race for 2016 is heating up and climate and energy are on the political docket. Google X space cowboy Andy Karsner and hedge fund billionaire and environmental advocate Tom Steyer are here to discuss the politics of climate in the midst of an unconventional election. The Republican elected officials are in a very different place on energy and climate than Republican voters. At North America's Pacific Coast is an economic powerhouse but can the region lead the global transition to a clean energy future? We have a population that wants the democratic system to really tackle this problem, and we are doing it. But first, the economics of getting off fossil fuels and plugging into the sun, wind, and other sources of renewable energy. The stuff we're seeing is dramatic, and it is cost competitive. Up next on Climate One. Our guests are leading economists and a Silicon Valley investor. Lord Nicholas Stern is a former chief economist of the World Bank and one of the foremost global experts on moving the economy from fossil fuels to cleaner energy. Steve Wesley leads a venture capital firm that made early investments in Tesla, where he served on the board, and the biofuel company Amaris. Please welcome them to Climate One. Thank you. Steve, tell us about when you invested in Tesla, there were 27 investors, 27 uh, employees, and, and what your wife thought about that investment. Well, yeah, no, I came home and I told my wife, you know, I've just invested in this new company. There's this guy, Elon Musk, and, you know, 27 guys in a warehouse in San Carlos, and we're going to revolutionize the global auto industry. And she said, you've lost your mind. Go get your money back. <laughs> um, and in the early days, it was not at all clear what would happen. But the fact is, and our first car, frankly, wasn't so hot, but by the time we got to the Model S, people said, wow. It was car of the year, safest car ever made, best performing car, highest reviews from Consumer Reports. It sort of showed people you can make an electric car that's transformative. But the narrative is always moved forward by the naysayers. Said, okay, okay, it's a great car, but..." It's a plaything for the rich, plaything for the rich, play. So fast forward 24 months, we know what the world's been waiting for. And the, the narrative is people won't buy electric cars. Here's some easy numbers for you. Roughly 400,000 electric cars in the world, 200,000, half of them in the United States, 100,000, half of those here in California, 400,000 total. What the world's been waiting for is a low cost electric car, read 30,000, dollars or less that goes 200 miles to deal with range anxiety. Tesla announced that car. Guess what? They've taken orders for 400,000. So doubling the entire world total. What's the future for oil companies? They have funded a lot of campaigns to slow down this transition. Uh, now that Paris brought the world together, there was a big corporate, <laughs> corporate America was there in Paris. Uh, what's, the, what's the impact of the transition for oil companies ahead, do you think? So, you know, I used to teach on the faculty at Stanford's Graduate School of Business and spent a lot of time on this issue of corporate strategy. The oil companies are in a pickle, and they're in a pickle for two reasons. Let me just say it flat out. You're seeing renewables at parity with oil, and the cost of renewables only goes one direction. That's down, and they're not, by and large, polluting. The world is moving that direction from a pure cost efficiency status. You throw in that global leaders are pushing things that way and it's just going to happen quickly. But the whole second part of it is there's this other shift and we're just starting to talk about it and that is the shift from baby boomers like me whose whole life has been about right, we've got to get the biggest TV we can and then the biggest car and the biggest house and then you throw it all out and you get a bigger one. That's going away. By January 2017, millennials become the biggest buying cohort in the world. By and large, they don't like oil companies. So here's the punchline. I was just talking with a friend 
uh, at Exxon. I said, well, how's the oil industry? He said, oh no, we're Exxon Gas. <laughs> we're not, no, 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 we're not, we're, no, no, the oil is, uh, that's, that's the past. Pretty soon, I want to suggest to you what I think is going to happen is the smart oil companies will diversify into renewables and other sources. They've got very deep balance sheets. The less smart ones will hang on for dear life, and they, I suspect, will go the way of dinosaurs. Uh, Nicholas Stern, on a country level, Saudi Arabia is looking at something comparable. This week, they announced a $2 trillion sovereign wealth fund. $2 trillion. They have a young prince who's in power to try to move the economy away from uh, petroleum to... Is that for real? And how, what is the global economic prospects of that? I think one of the remarkable things is how countries like Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia in particular, have seen the way the world is going. And they know that uh, their asset uh, is one which doesn't have much of a future. If we're to hold to two degrees uh, centigrade as increase in global surface temperature above the second half of the 19th century, if we're to hold to that, as we must, because it's so dangerous to, to go beyond, then if we want a decent probability of that happening, we can't burn more than um, perhaps a third or 40%, depending how you look at the probabilities of success, of the reserves of fossil fuels that we already know about. They have to stay in the ground, or it has to be carbon capture and use or, or storage. So, in other words, those assets, if we are to hold to two degrees centigrade, which is what we've agreed in Paris, actually well below, um, are not worth all that much. So it's very important that we plan ahead to see how we can manage that transition in a way that uh, is uh, cheerful, positive, in, in, invests in the alternatives. And the oil companies have to see that. Nick Stern, you wrote a book, Why Are We Waiting? As, you know, behavioral economics is a big thing recently. Uh, so tell us, there's so much information, abundance of facts, why are we as individuals, as humans and countries, not moving faster when our planet's on fire? The key is to understand what's possible and that it's uh, extremely attractive. And I think that uh, in Paris, uh, the tipping point came where the 195 countries really wanted an agreement. It came when they understood that this is not only possible, it's also very attractive. So that's the... Uh, argument that we have to win. We have been waiting because that argument took a long time to gain traction. I think it's gaining traction now, but we have to demonstrate how it works. And the road from Paris is the road that demonstrates that the alternative way of doing things is cheaper, more attractive, more exciting, cities where you can move, cities where you can breathe. That's the key. And we're gradually getting there it's picking up speed, but we're not going anywhere near fast enough. Steve Wesley, if the economic opportunity is so big, how come a lot of venture investors in Silicon Valley have pulled out of clean tech? They are not there. They got burned. They swaggered in and said, hey, we're smart. We'll figure this out. We'll tell you how it's done. They lost some money. And there's not a lot of money in Silicon Valley going into energy other than some software type plays, Nest, etc. So is that accurate? Why is that? Well, this is why you need to be investing in our fund today. <laughs> no, look, the, the simple reason is if you look backward, people lost a lot of money because they came in too early. Just like if you saw one of the first mobile phones that weighed 10 pounds and cost $5,000, you'd say, no one's going to buy these crazy things. Fast forward 36 months, the cost goes <coughs> below $500, the weight drops down below uh, a few ounces, and you sell a billion units. We're in that same point. I used to serve on the board of Tesla. The first car we had, the little Roadster, cost $120,000 I could get in. I couldn't get out. It was dreadful. <laughs> now we have a car, 30,000 miles, uh, $30,000, and it may become the biggest selling car in America. So the key is you look forward, not backward. There's an inflection point in every area of the economy, and I'm here to tell you we're hitting that inflection point in renewables now. That's a great thing for the economy, it's an even better thing for the planet. Uh, Nicholas Stern, one way that a lot of people will feel climate impacts is on water. So what do you see the output, the global prospect for water? It, it, 
A absolutely right there, Greg. The climate change is largely about water. Uh, it's about uh, extreme weather events and storms. It's about uh, desertification in some places. It's about sea level rise. It's about flooding. Um, it's about water in some, or the lack of it in some shape or form. Southern Europe, um, at not much above two degrees, could start to look like the Sahara Desert. Um, there are going to be some places which, uh, I mean, the stress on water in California is probably going to get a lot worse, not, not better. Steve Wesley on the wa future of water in California. Well, there's three steps here. First, we've come to realize that you can produce energy in almost any part of the planet. It may be solar, it may be wind, it may be gas, but you can create energy where you want. You can't create water out of thin air. And what we're realizing is the planet gets warmer is that these ice caps in the mountains, whether it's the Himalayas, which serves about three billion people, or the Andes, or the Rockies, as these things slowly melt and there's less, uh, we've got to get smarter. And that means three things. Number one, we've got to get smart about conservation. And that means social behavior software and just saving more. Second step is we need to do a better job with capture and storage. So long before you do 44-foot tunnels and massive projects, we need more storage. And then the third thing is recycling. And that's going to mean gray water use, and it's going to mean municipal recycling. And people say, w w did he just say we're going to have to drink water that people have peed in? And the answer is yes. Get used to it. You will see recycling. It's part of the new future. If we're smart, we'll do a much better job with conservation and with storage, and we can avoid the expensive step of recycling, but we're probably looking at a world with all three. Briefly, what gives you hope and fear? Nick Stern, about climate. Paris Agreement gave me hope, not only because 195 countries got together to agree on something tough but very valuable, but also because it was founded on an understanding of how attractive the different way of, of doing things could be and was becoming. What makes me fearful is how slowly that process is moving, even though it's picking up and accelerating. The next 20 years are absolutely decisive. We've got very little headroom on greenhouse gases if we're to hold uh, temperatures to uh, levels which are not uh, dangerous. And we will be building infrastructure around the world in the next 20 years we'll be adding one and a half to two times of the infrastructure that we've already got. And if we do that badly, lock in dirty, unsustainable infrastructure, any chance of holding to two degrees will be absolutely gone. Steve Wesley, hope and fear. Yeah, let me start with the fear part. I, I used to be in elective office and gee whiz, I'm fearful of elected officials having been one. They just take a long time and you worry about hard to manage countries like India can they move off coal quickly enough to save this planet we all share? What gives me hope is that we're seeing these dramatic breakthroughs in technologies from electric vehicles to, uh, to, to uh, efficiencies in solar. The stuff we're seeing is dramatic and it is cost competitive. There is no reason not to move into this greener new world. But what really gives me hope are millennials because they get it. They want a smaller footprint, they're used to measuring everything, and they are by and large consumers that are making smarter decisions than their parents ever did. That gives me hope. We're gonna include our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One. Thank you, my name is John Balbeck, and I'm president of the Global Innovation Exchange, which is a, a mini NASDAQ for climate solutions. And my question is about finance, and, and I know that the, the, both of your minds um, are fantastic on this. When, when we look at the dollar amounts needed to keep us at or below two degrees um, Celsius, it, the numbers I've seen are 16 trillion to uh, 20 trillion, and cover, call it over the next 10 years. I guess first, do you, do you resonate with that number? And absent the governments forcing the markets in some fashion, how, how do you see uh, that, that amount of capital moving within a 10-year time frame. Thank you. Thank Steve, you. where's the money going to come from? A lot of numbers, big, trillion. Like. Uh, look, uh, the big number doesn't bother me. Here's why. Two points. First, 
Consumers make choices all the time. And the good news here is that renewables are largely reaching cost parity with carbon-based solutions in this new millennial marketplace. And frankly, their parents as well are going to say, given a choice, if it's at cost parity, I'll take the cleaner fuel. And again, cost of oil goes up and down. Cost of renewables only goes down. That's a pretty straightforward choice. Point two, there's been no charge or tax uh, on carbon or pollution. Today, in this millennial world, it's easy to measure everything. There will be a cost on carbon. I don't know whether it's two years, four years, six years. We're measuring it. It's becoming a big deal. Even in China, they now know. They used to sort of sweep it under the rug, but the amount of pollution there is not sustainable. It leads to social unrest. The Chinese understand this, and that's why even in China, they're cutting back on coal production. The world's heading in the right direction. We just need to help get it there sooner and don't underestimate the role California can play in doing that. Let's go to our next question, Climate One, welcome. Hi, my name's Catherine. I work at a shared electric vehicle startup called Evercar in the city. And Great. I was just wondering, Good. I loved hearing your talk about the race in electric vehicles. I was wondering if both in the US and elsewhere, if we're seeing a race in the proliferation of charging stations, and if charging stations currently will be able to handle the influx of people buying electric vehicles, and what are the challenges that exist there? Okay, well, Can I, I love this question, go Bears. Three points. First, the best news of all here is not just that there's a proliferation now of electric charging stations. I've had an electric car for three or four years. When I first had it, there weren't so many around. It was a bit inconvenient. That issue has largely gone away. It's improving. It is improving a lot. By the way, there are websites you can go to on your car, and they will not only say, hey, you can plug in here or there. There's some that will say, come to my house, and you can charge in my garage, and I'll give you a cup of coffee. It is dramatic. But here's the other thing that I think is so interesting. In my generation, a lot of us, we'd count down the days till we were 16 to get a car, our own car. Americans had to have a car. That's changing. The new generation knows better. They're willing to share cars. That's the way of the future. 20, 25 years from now, people will be saying, who's going to want to own a car? That's a big shift. Up next, an environmental advocate and Google X space cowboy on what's driving energy policy this election and the importance of the Paris Climate Summit. Andy Karsner was an assistant secretary of energy in the second Bush administration. He's currently a managing partner at Emerson Collective, a social benefit organization founded by Lorreen Powell Jobs. He's also a space cowboy at Google X. We'll, we'll learn what that is. Tom Steyer is a hedge fund billionaire and president of Next Gen Climate, a political organization that aims to prevent climate disaster and promote prosperity for every American. Please welcome them to Climate One. <laughs> Tom Steyer, your take on Paris, is it a big success or a glass half empty, half full? Well, I think that the biggest significance of me to Paris is that 196 countries, the most countries to ever agree to do anything, decided that climate was the most important thing that they would get around and make a statement about what had to happen. So from my standpoint, it's got to be viewed as a big success. And it, in particular, I think that the leading emitters came to Paris and agreed that they were in fact going to change their behavior, that they were going to push. And I think that President Obama and the administration deserve a lot of credit for the bilateral negotiations that happened beforehand that really set up Paris to a very large extent, starting with the agreement with the Chinese. What do you make, uh, Tom Starr, as a businessman, of the presence uh, in Paris of Coca-Cola, Disney, General Electric? Corporate America was there and on board, uh, at least symbolically. Maybe it might get, they might get a little squirrely if it gets, starts to hurt their specific businesses. But symbolically, they were on board in Paris. Well, I think one of the big successes in Paris and that it was different from the previous negotiations is that what I would think of as civil society really showed up. So that include, includes businesses, it includes nonprofits. It was basically a statement from a very broad group of important actors from around the world that they were going to be part of the solution here. And particularly as somebody from California, and we were, my wife and I were in Paris, you could see an enormous number of people from California and the, the one I like to point out is Kaiser Permanente, a health organization 
who decided that it was really important for them to be there and to make a statement about what, how they were going to behave in the future and why it was important for the hundreds of thousands of people and the health of the hundreds of thousands of people that they work for. Andy Karzner, if corporate America is on board behind this, why doesn't Paris have more political support from the National Republican Party? <laughs> Well, I mean, one, uh, there's so many different ways to divide that question. I mean, uh, uh, what national Republican political party would be my first, uh, you know, you know which, which brand, uh, you know, this week? Uh, um, so, I mean, that, that, uh, that's probably easier for somebody who didn't historically uh, uh, grow up Republican to answer as a pundit than it would be for someone eminently confused about having their party hijacked by a narcissistic lout. So, so you, you, you know, so, so, but it, it, I think irrespective of, of uh, current uh, bizarre hopeful ab aberrations to the party of Lincoln, um, one, would, um, one would say irrespective to that, uh, that most of the constituency base of the Republican Party, uh, non-urban, middle of the country places, have a uh, uh, more significant learning curve uh, that needs to be climbed, uh, um, and that uh, we need to uh, help them climb in all kinds of ways. Tom Steyer, you're running ads, uh, pressuring certain uh, politicians, so tell us how you think that this will play out. You think you can hold Republicans accountable, get some people to come out on this issue? First of all, Republican voters have moved on this. If you go around the country and ask Republicans, do you want the government to accelerate the move to clean energy, you get 75% of Republicans who want that. So it's not true that Republicans aren't up the learning curve. They, it's, it, they're different from Democrats. They're not as positive about clean energy, but they're very positive about clean energy. And they've moved a lot in the last two years specifically, pretty much in lockstep with American business. So as American business has actually come around to, we have to do it, we can do it, we can make money doing it, it's a good thing for us to be part of for a whole bunch of reasons, including the fact that we're patriotic Americans, Republican voters have moved the exact same way. The real question that I would ask Republicans is, the Republican elected officials are in a very different place on energy and climate than Republican voters. And I could speculate about that, but the fact of the matter is, if you go around the country, pretty much without exception, Republican voters do not have their heads in the sand. This may not be the most important issue to them, and in fact, it isn't the most important issue to them, which is why elected officials can have some freedom. But the fact of the matter is, Americans have moved very substantially on this, including Republicans, including the vast bulk of American business people, and the country is ready to move, but we are being held hostage by elected officials who are not actually representing the views of their own constituents, of their own party. So what are you but, doing but, uh, to let me just, Andy Carson? Let me just say uh, that I don't necessarily disagree with what Tom has just characterized, but he, we, we changed the terminology in there, right? Uh, so I agree with what you just said about their uh, uh, support and, and uh, 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 general favoritism towards clean energy. It is quite separate to uh, their acceptance of climate science, right? And, and so, uh, you know, there's a reason why Texas leads in renewable energy, and yet Texas also is one of the most reticent states embracing climate science. I mean, and it's precisely because if they can make uh, money off the energy and it's patriotic and it's good technology, why not? You know, uh, but the idea of doing something that induces greater acceleration towards policy or a more comprehensive bipartisan sequel, if you will, to some of those pieces 10 years ago, uh, that's more challenging. I want to talk about coal miners in Appalachia, people, loggers, etc. Andy Karsner, what's to be done but some people who will be hurt by this transition to a clean economy? Lots of jobs will be created, but if you're a 50-year-old coal miner, the U.S. coal industry is going away. Yeah. What, what could be done for I, that? I, I think it's one of the most important under uh, um, uh, under-addressed questions in all of this, right? In, in other words, as we're up here calling for better thinking, better policies, better technologies, faster implementation, go fast forward on a big meta and macro problem, we cannot lose sight 
of, of, uh, of the real things that are coming, uh, uh, that we have to deal with from the ground up in our homes, in our schools, in our communities. Um, and it has been, it's a big focus of, of, uh, of mine and it's uh, 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 the prevailing reason why uh, um, I'm so happy to be part of Emerson Collective where we focus on humanity-centric solutions and the justice embedded in them. Uh, uh, we began this country to, uh, um, uh, with, the, with the advent of the light bulb, I should say, we began in this country to uh, aggressively and assertively uh, pursue something called the social compact. Uh, that is delivering electricity as a universal good to every American in every corner in every community to have access to light so that they could read at night with extra literacy, so that they could cool their food and store it longer, so that they could change the temperature and live in Florida or in the deserts of Phoenix or whatever. And we, we sort of take that for granted. We only finished it a quarter century ago. It was in my lifetime that the last homes in Arkansas were getting wired up, right? But we now are at the precipice uh, uh, of, of needing to revise all of that. We, uh, uh, not just the urgency of new solutions that have to be implemented that, as you rightfully suggest, are going to cause massive dislocations, but um, we have a need to ensure that the social compact itself evolves so that it's beyond access to electricity, which we take for granted, and is access to all of the technologies that are available now to improve people's lives. Detroit and Silicon Valley are kind of getting together now, coming together with electric cars, connected cars. How do you see that as, as a, a big disruption in job creator? Well, I think it's huge. I mean, it's in no secret. There's a lot of stuff I work on that's secret, but uh, autonomous vehicles isn't one of them. Um, and and uh, um, this I, isn't your role at Google X, right? Uh, um, uh, as a strategist, but but I I think that. Um, uh, uh, if you'd asked people about autonomous vehicles 60 months ago, they'd have said, you know, well, you really are a space cowboy. What are you smoking? <laughs> and, and, uh, but they don't now. Today, they, uh, Ford has uh, opened up a uh, research center uh, uh, here. People are moving to the West Coast and saying we have to be part of it. And so uh, um, uh, when I left office, there were approximately zero electric vehicles on the road. You know, now there is, I think, in excess of 17 different models uh, on the road. And, and, um, and now we're not talking about those vehicles, one per driveway in this sort of Jeffersonian way that uh, every kid uh, with testosterone is going to go rev one up and uh, run the strip like, uh, like uh, when we were kids, you know, rev the motor. Um, uh, uh, now the kids are saying, well, you know, where the hell do I need that? I've got an instant in-demand uh, on-demand chauffeur in my pocket. You know, I can uh, drink <laughs> as much as I want at the clubs and uh, I don't want a driver's license. So the licenses are going down, the models are changing, the ride sharing in a collaborative economy is skyrocketing, the number of apps and innovation around the ecosystem of mobility, not, it's not about the car anymore as part of an American dream, it's about the ease and access of mobility on demand in the most environmental, uh, environmentally sensitive way with the most efficient outcome. So we're going to eliminate idling in this country and all the related emissions from it. And it's going to happen with these, with these wild-eyed dreamers and kids that are in Silicon Valley. And it's going to be a contagion because the ideas are too good. Okay. Uh, I want to go to our lightning round and ask each of you a uh, brief yes or no question. Andy Karsner, yes or no, California is in a drought. <laughs> is in a drought? In a drought. Yes. Uh, is Last it... I checked. Yes. Not everyone uh, has said that recently. Um, <laughs> Tom Steyer, U.S. rejection of the Keystone XL pipeline has resulted in more oil traveling through American communities on rail cars that occasionally become deadly fireballs. Stopping Keystone put oil on rail cars that go through American communities, yes or no? No. Uh, Andy Karsner, U.S. rejection of the Keystone XL pipeline has kept in the ground oil from Canadian tar sands. Yes no, or no? No. Uh, Tom Steyer, do you drive a pure electric car? I drive a plug-in hybrid that, a Chevy Volt, which, where I'm driving on electricity, but it has a backup engine in case I run out of electricity. And why don't you drive a Tesla? Can't afford it. Can't afford it. <laughs> too, too cheap. Okay. <laughs> Andy Karsner. Are more Republicans in Washington, D.C. in the gay closet or the climate closet? <laughs> 
know. I, oh. it, I guess I call it a draw. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Tom Steyer, sooner or later, most of them will come out. They will definitely come out of the climate closet. Um, <clears throat> Tom Steyer, after the presidential election in November, you will decide if you will run for governor of California in 2018. I will decide. Uh, this is a word association, so I'm gonna mention some names, words. You're just gonna tell me the first thing that pops into your mind. Not the second thing, the first thing. Uh, Tom Steyer, California Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. Baseball player. Left-handed first base baseman from Silic uh, Santa Clara University. Uh, also Tom Steyer, former mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Villarosa. Great dinner companion. Last one, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Steve Wesley. Classmate of mine in business school. Andy Karsner, Sarah Palin. <laughs> Nut job. <laughs> Potential uh, Secretary of Energy, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tom Steyer, Volkswagen. Cheated on their diesel test. Uh, all right, I think we'll have to end it there. Let's give our thanks. How they do? I think they did pretty well. Uh, we are going to go to your questions and invite you to join us over there at that microphone. Let's go to our audience question. Welcome. Maybe putting aside your own personal beliefs about fascism or socialism, which of the current uh, pl uh, presidential candidates do you think has the best track record in terms of climate change? Andy Karsner. Well, I, I think Trump has no real record whatsoever on almost anything. So, I mean, it's, you know, if the question is record, I mean, that's, you know, he's out. Um, um, if, 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 uh, but in policy, he's um, out too. But I don't, I don't equate uh, rhetorical empathy or sympathy on this issue with a record of results. And then uh, uh, Senator, then Secretary uh, uh, Clinton, um, you know, her record uh, as a senator, uh, uh, short-term overlap uh, during a period where this didn't come up in the Senate uh, by design, they pivoted to health care, um, and, and really uh, her record in the White House, in the, in the administration, belongs to the Obama administration. So I don't actually know what a president Hillary Clinton would be, is why I would like to see what's in, in the, uh, but we know that they are sympathetic and acknowledging the issue, but, you know, acknowledging AIDS is not the same as saying I have the best possible policies that I intend to implement to fight this problem and eradic eradicate it, right? And I don't see anybody standing that is doing that in an assertive, intelligent, principled way that is galvanizing the necessary coalitions to implement. We're talking about energy with Andy Karsner and Tom Steyer. Let's go to our next question. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys so much for your talk. My question is around something that I see as kind of underlying a lot of the issues that you talked about today, and that is accountability and the lack of it that we see in a lot of the public officials, as you spoke about. So my question is, what is it going to take, kind of what is it, what's going to have to change for these public officials to begin to hold themselves accountable to the trends that we clearly see in their voter populations? And maybe what are some things and movements or trends that excite you that are working towards achieving that goal? Tom Steyer, you said earlier that people don't really, uh, politicians don't lose their job because of a vote on climate, because it's too far down the list. Well, I said something, I, I, I said something slightly different, differently from that. What I said was that Republican voters don't prioritize climate as one of their top three issues, and therefore they don't change their vote based on climate, and therefore if you're running in a deep red district where your opposition is, where you're fighting to be the most conservative person, you will not lose your position by disagreeing with the majority of your constituents on climate. The way that this will happen, and we are seeing it happen, is a combination of two things. In the purple states, the places that can go either way, we have four Republican senators who are in favor of the clean power plan. And the reason they've moved is they don't think they can get reelected if they oppose the clean power plan. They're in states where it's very close, independence will be there. And so there are two reasons that could be true. It could be because people really, really care about clean energy and climate, and so therefore you can't win in that state unless you're on the right side. Or it could be that not accepting common science is so stupid that you have a right to do it, but you basically disqualify yourself with a number of the people of the voters. So for instance, I like to say, 
nobody's top three issue is the law of gravity. But if you want to run for, uh, for Senate or governor and you don't believe in the law of gravity, a lot of people are just going to go, it's great, you can not believe in it, but we're not going to vote for you because it's too stupid. And that is happening. We do see that, that even for people who, who don't necessarily prioritize this in a way that you know, I, I do, they do think, gosh, if you don't accept science on this, what else don't you accept science on? And that's really not an appropriate attitude for somebody who wants to hold high office. Still to come, the Pacific Coast is vying to lead the clean energy transition. We're pleased to welcome with us three distinguished guests. Kate Brown is governor of Oregon, a Democrat. She previously was the secretary of state and served 17 years in the state legislature, where she was the first woman to be Senate majority leader. Jay Inslee is governor of Washington. He was a Democratic member of Congress for 15 years and served in the Clinton administration as regional director of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mary Pollack is Minister of the Environment in British Columbia. She's been a member of the provincial legislature since 2005 and previously served as Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Please welcome them to Climate One. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Governor Inslee, when people think about climate change, it's often very abstract, uh, but Washington is an agricultural state. You recently signed a deal with uh, some other West Coast states, California, Washington, and cities, to get at food and food waste. So tell us how food and agriculture is, is a climate issue, something people can relate to. Yeah, well, this is not an, an abstract. When you're a governor of a Western state that is being assaulted by climate change, that is damaging people you know. This is not an abstraction. This is not a graph. This is not a parts per million issue. This is looking at a family that's lost their home in a forest fire uh, last year. And I remember seeing a lady in Wenatchee, Washington, standing in front of the charred rem uh, you know, remains of her home, and she just said, where is my house? You know, where is my house? And that sense of shock that she had, that sense of emotion was the face of climate change. And we governors are seeing it in the West Coast right now. We had uh, forest fires larger than, burned an area larger than the state of Delaware in the state of Washington last year. I've uh, had to talk to oyster growers that have had to move their operations because of ocean acidification has it made impossible to breed some of the, uh, the larvae. I look at farmers that worry about uh, their, their water supplies because we got a good snowpack this year, but guess what? It's all melting off. Mm -hmm within two or three weeks, so we've got no irrigation. Now, we could double our, our wine production in the state of Washington, but you can't do it if you don't have water. So when I think of climate change, I think of the faces that I have seen of people whose lives are being uh, threatened by this emergency, uh, this emergent uh, problem. So this is personal, it's real, it's here, and it demands an urgent response. And, you know, I, I, if I can just give you my thoughts of this, we gotta do two things. We gotta come at this with a fighting spirit. And that's what you got to have. This is a fight. Somebody's coming to our house, and they're wrecking our house, number one. And number two, we got to have a sense of confidence that we can win this. And we have a sense of confidence in our state because we build jet airliners, we build great software, and we know we're building some of the best clean energy technology. So uh, you bet, this is real. Governor Brown, uh, Governor Inslee just said someone's coming into our house, but we created this mess. So how do we deal with something that we've created and do it so quickly? Well, we're focused in Oregon in a number of areas, but uh, primarily around coal and cars, because those are the two primary producers of greenhouse gas emissions in Oregon. And so we tackled cars uh, by passing our low carbon fuel standard uh, last year, which I signed into law. And then we tackled coal over a period of time, 1997. We said, we're not gonna build any more coal-powered uh, electricity generating plants in Oregon. And in um, a few years ago, we agreed to shut down our only coal-powered electricity plant uh, at Boardman uh, that will be shut down by 2020. And then most recently, I signed into law a bill that will move Oregon away from coal-generated electricity. We are the first state in the nation to do that. That bill also required that we move to 50% renewables by 2040. So I'm very proud. 
Oregon is not um, a huge part of the global problem. We're a small state. We only have four million people, but we can be part of the solution, and that's exactly what we're doing. Minister Pollack, in some ways, British Columbia was out ahead of even California <laughs> and uh, Washington and Oregon in terms of putting a price on carbon pollution, and uh, so far, I don't think it's trashed your economy. BC's mm -hmm. still doing pretty well. Tell us how that worked out. Well, the short answer is uh, our experience with having a revenue neutral carbon tax is emissions are down and the economy is up. Uh, we have a, an economy in British Columbia that has been outperforming the rest of Canada, uh, even through the 2008-2009 downturn. Uh, that was, by the way, when we brought in our carbon tax. Uh, you might think we're crazy for doing that, uh, instituting a new tax when you have a, an economic downturn. Uh, but the evidence now is pretty overwhelming that it not only dropped our uh, petroleum consumption across all fuel types, uh, but we believe it actually strengthened our economy. Every dollar of our carbon tax is returned to British Columbians in either direct tax reductions or, in the case of low-income people, uh, direct rebate checks to them. So you're constantly recirculating this, uh, these dollars back into the economy, giving people the ability to make their own choices. And because it is so broad, it impacts on everyday people's behaviour. We all know that there are industries we need to tackle, we know that there are power grids we need to tackle, all sorts of the big things uh, that governments can get a hold of. Uh, but if you really want those deep emissions reductions, you have to do things that are going to change the market for electricity, uh, for clean electricity, and you have to do things that are going to change the behaviours of everyday people that live in your communities. A lot of the time that British Columbia was doing that, there was a national government in Canada, the Harper government, that left the Kyoto Protocol that was very uh, pro-fossil fuels and hostile to climate action. So how did BC move forward when the, the national conversation was very different? And then we'll get to the United States, which maybe heading down that path. <laughs> <laughs> It, it was very difficult. Uh, we, we now are joined by some fantastic partners in the world of carbon pricing uh, in uh, provinces like Ontario, Quebec, uh, Alberta. They've all now, uh, they're, they're some ways down uh, the pathway of having a price on carbon. They're still not as broad or as high as ours. Ours is about uh, $30 Canadian a tonne. That would equate to about uh, 20 cents US on a gallon of gas, uh, for example. Um, but I'll tell you, the most exciting thing for me about COP21 in Paris uh, was seeing the Prime Minister and the Premiers walk in and people reacting with, great, Canada's back. Uh, for us now, uh, we have our federal government leading the development of a pan-Canadian framework. And thankfully, thankfully, uh, one of the working groups they have uh, preparing materials for the Prime Minister and the Premiers uh, is a working group working on uh, a national carbon price and what that might look like. Mm -hmm. Governor Inslee, you served in Congress 15 years. It's a very different situation in the United States and Washington where climate is, is basically uh, pl highly politicized. There's a presidential candidate who uh, would, says he would revoke, cancel the Paris climate deal. So how can states and, and cities move forward when it's kind of a toxic debate at the national level? Yeah, it's still, you know, it's still surprising to me. I mean, if you're at the top of the Trump Tower, you can see the curvature of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, a, we have a presidential candidate who belongs to the Flat Earth Society, so I don't understand what the difficulty uh, is here. Um, we're moving forward in Washington State, and uh, the people of Washington State want us to respond to this challenge. And they understand, and the reason is they understand the health of their children at risk, uh, not just the polar bear. So we have a population that wants the democratic system to really tackle this problem, and we are doing it. Mary Pollack, uh, Rachel Notley was elected uh, premier of the neighboring province, Alberta, uh, which is like the Texas of, uh, of Canada. <laughs> That's kind of like, she's a very progressive person. That's kind of like Jerry Brown being elected governor of Texas. Uh, <laughs> so tell us how that has affected the politics around energy and politics in general in Western Canada, because that was quite a seismic shift. So uh, first, let's all agree that nobody's like uh, Governor Jerry Brown. Right? So, <laughs> um, it has really, the conversation across Canada uh, has changed dramatically in, in the last uh, year or so. Uh, but particularly in Alberta, where there was always uh, massive resistance uh, to taking action on climate uh, and that uh, around carbon pricing in particular. Uh, now we see uh, Alberta announcing that they will have 
a carbon price that will begin at $20 a ton. Uh, next year will go to $30 a ton uh, by 2018. It's not quite as broad as British Columbia's, uh, but we'll take it because uh, being out in front as we have been has been tremendously challenging for our businesses. Uh, one of the uh, difficult challenges for uh, jurisdictions, subnational jurisdictions I think in particular, is that uh, you, can, you can drive really hard down the climate action path if you go too far too fast, uh, you simply cause industries to move to another jurisdiction where they can continue to emit and do so more cheaply. So you have to find that right balance in terms of putting the pressure on through carbon pricing, but not putting the pressure on to such an extent um, that you then see that industry uh, move to another jurisdiction and uh, simply emit elsewhere. So with partners now uh, like Alberta, and then, of course, the pricing we're seeing through cap and trade in Ontario and Quebec, uh, national carbon pricing being discussed by the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm very hopeful that you're going to see uh, increasing progress on carbon pricing in Canada. Uh, it's interesting the way the politics has shifted, though. Uh, you now have, uh, first of all, uh, the female premiers in Canada, yes, go women, um, <laughs> are the ones who are advocating that the federal government be uh, more directly involved um, in addressing climate in, uh, in our country. So uh, that has been a real shift, and it's one we think is very positive for British Columbia. James, Greg, could I, could sure. I, can I piggyback on this issue of carbon pricing? Um, we have a carbon pricing initiative on our ballot this fall that would establish uh, a carbon uh, tax, essentially. And um, uh, it's unlikely to succeed because it, uh, although it was billed originally as being revenue neutral, it in fact, according to the analysis, reduces state revenues by several hundred million dollars because of some drafting issues. And this is of concern to a lot of people, including myself, because this would take money out of our school funds. And the reason I mention this is that I think it is likely this will not prevail. And I do believe it will not be a negative a comment to the extent that to, to somehow suggest that Washington doesn't care about climate change I think if it does not pass, it will just say that Washingtonians care about school budgets and don't want to reduce hundreds of million dollars in school budgets. And I say that because I think it's an important message. We're going to move forward, we hope, over time on issues like this, but it won't be this fall. I'd like to go to our lightning round right now. We're asking each of you a uh, yes or no question, uh, starting with Mary Pollack. Uh, yes or no, Canada is considering building a wall to keep out undocumented Americans <laughs> fleeing north after the upcoming presidential election. <laughs> yes or no? That'd be no. <laughs> we, we want people to come and work in Canada. We need people. Uh, Governor Inslee, uh, Washington is the second largest wine producer in the country after California. During your trip to California, you are secretly going to Napa Valley, Valley wineries and encouraging <laughs> them to move to your state as temperatures become too hot for some varietals in California's wine-growing regions. Yes or no? Well, you're, you're on to me, but I'll tell you what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> this is a serious issue. Napa Valley is moving to Washington yeah. oh, because the climatic conditions <laughs> that exist. Can to, I interrupt? You want to yeah. move to, oh. <laughs> Napa Valley is moving to Oregon. <laughs> that is really clear. <laughs> so. Through Oregon and then on up to uh, uh, Governor Brown, traffic in Seattle is worse than traffic in Portland, yes or no? Yes. Uh, <laughs> that, is because, that is because Portland has invested in an extensive light rail system. We, we were blessed by early leadership. Folks like Congressman Earl Blumenauer and Governor Barbara Roberts worked really hard to partner with the federal government to uh, both uh, have the vision for light rail and get it implemented. Governor Inslee, Seattle should have invested more in its scrawny light rail system and managed it better. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> I will point out that we just passed, and I, this is actually a matter of some pride, uh, we passed the, not only the largest transportation package uh, in our state's history, but the greenest transportation package with the heaviest percentage attributable to light rail. We're going to build a light rail system, we hope, from Everett to, to uh, Tacoma. Uh, bike lanes, HOV, rapid transit bus, and we're proud of that achievement because your transportation policy is just about as important as anything else you do and when it comes to the world of carbon. And I think that's easy to forget. Any infrastructure that we invest in today 
has a carbon footprint, and, and we have, we've been diligent in making sure that we think about that when we make our infrastructure improvements. Mary Pollock, Vancouver, British Columbia is adequately prepared for sea level rise that will occur in your lifetime. Yes, no, <laughs> absolutely not. And uh, it's one of the things I think that motivates Vancouver uh, to be so aggressively pursuing their climate action agenda uh, inside our province. Governor Inslee, the $3 billion tunnel being bored under downtown Seattle to ease traffic congestion is adequately protected from rising seas that could flood it and make it a very expensive slip and slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to say yes, just so we can maintain our confidence. <laughs> uh, Governor Brown, U.S. rejection of the Keystone XL pipeline shifted transport of Canadian tar sands oils to rail cars that pass through many American communities. It, I'm Stopping Keystone put Canadian tar sands oil onto rail cars to get to market. Probably, yes. So I want to go back to another important point that Governor Inslee raised, and that is our transportation infrastructure. Oregon led the nation uh, many years ago with our land use planning system. And that has been a very wonderful tool for keeping our urban communities uh, c c intact and helping us build uh, transportation infrastructure. And I just think that that is a tool that we do not, don't always think of uh, when we're talking about global climate change because having climate cities, uh, uh, compact cities, enables us to uh, develop a transportation infrastructure that enables people to get to places very easily. And you can do it in a way that promotes health as well through walking and biking. And so I just wanna put that on the, the radar screen. Governor Inslee, under President Obama, domestic production of fossil fuels has soared, yes or no? Uh, there has been clearly an increase, and there's a certain irony, but having said that, I want to tell you, I'm so glad that President Obama has been president the last eight years. His leadership on this has been tremendous, and uh, he has stood up against uh, enormous, uh, you know, flatter society members in the U.S. Congress that are dominant in one of those chambers. And his act of leadership is going to succeed, I believe, so thank him. Uh, Governor Brown, who will win the Oregon-Washington border battle this year between the Oregon Ducks football team and the Washington Huskies? <laughs> I'm confident that our award-winning Ducks will be successful. <laughs> Governor Inslee, who will win the Oregon-Washington border battle this year between the Oregon Ducks football team and the Washington Huskies? Well, it'll be the Huskies, and they'll be using our good bike lanes and bus <laughs> to, to, to get home. Mary Pollock, as a Canuck, do you even know what is an Oregon duck? <laughs> I'm guessing it doesn't quack. Okay. <laughs> All right, that ends our lightning round. I'll give them a round of applause. Thanks for them. <laughs> Thanks, um, you guys. That was fun. That was Let's go to our audience questions at Climate One. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Governor Inslee, I understand that uh, small hydro plants uh, could be the answer, especially for Western Washington. Not the big plants that need big dams, but the small localized hydroelectric projects. Could you comment on that, on the future of hydroelectric power I in think, Washington? I, I think there is some opportunities, particularly for run of the river systems, so they do not block the river, but in fact they capture the kinetic energy and don't disturb it too dramatically. There are several new research projects. One went in, in fact, just where I used to live, over in the Yakima Valley, that are in an R&D phase. I don't think they're going to have a very significant import, though. I, I think this will be a, you know, fractions of percent. Let's have our next question. Welcome to Climate One. Uh, Bob Archer, Citizens Climate Lobby. Thank you to British Columbia for demonstrating the transparency, effectiveness, and predictability of a revenue neutral carbon tax. My question is for Governor Brown and Governor Inslee. If in the next Congress, the Republicans introduce a sound revenue neutral carbon tax, would you in principle endorse that? That's a Particularly really- Particularly the revenue neutrality characteristic. I think in terms of carbon policy, that if we can get a national policy that will incent and motivate us to reduce greenhouse gas emission reductions, then that is a good thing. So I've Governor just, Inslee. unfortunately, I've got to be a truth teller here, and sometimes that's a hard job. There is zero chance of that particular party being a, a productive uh, <laughs> uh, proponent of any policies because they are captured by those that deny the clear science of this. And as long as they deny the clear science of that, it's impossible for them in, at the moment to be productive partners. And, and we, have, we, have, we have discovered that in the state of Washington. The proponents of this carbon uh, tax system that's going to be on the ballot this fall, 
Uh, they believed that the Republican Party would rush to embrace it as a non-regulatory uh, way to deal with carbon. And there hasn't been one single voice raised in, in that regard. So unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. Right now, what I'm proposing, in, we're putting into place, as I said today, which is a limitation on carbon. Uh, uh, emitters will be required to reduce their emissions through a regulatory system. That's what I'm in favor of. Governor Inslee, last word. What can an average person do to make a difference? Tell your grandchildren, your children, your nieces and nephews, if they don't vote, they're getting written out of the will. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> we have to end it there. Our thanks to uh, Governor Perfect. I just, I just want to add one thing while we're talking voting. I literally won my first race for the House of Representatives in the state of Oregon by seven votes. So I am living proof that every vote matters and that your vote is your voice and I, your voices must be heard, particularly for younger people. That's Governor Kate Brown of Oregon. We've also been hearing from Governor Jay Inslee of Washington and Mary Pollack, Minister of the Environment in British Columbia. I'm Greg Dalton. I'd like to thank our audience here in San Francisco and online and on air. Thank you all for joining us today for this Climate One Conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.